The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government wants to implement marijuana legalization as soon as possible, and it's really not a good idea. One of the Liberal ideas is to allow home cultivation of four plants of pot in every house in Canada. Fortunately, Mr. Speaker, the government's obsessive approach has just hit a wall because two provinces, Quebec and Manitoba, are refusing. Will the Liberal government respect provincial jurisdiction and respect the provinces? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Protecting the health and safety of Canadians is an absolute priority for our government. Home cultivation will help displace the illegal market. This will apply to uh, provinces and territories, and we are also following the advice of the working group uh, and representatives of various jurisdictions in the U.S. who have legalized cannabis. Thank you. The Honourable Member for the saint -Laurent. Mr. Speaker, what a lack of respect. I'm not the one saying it. It's the Liberal Minister of Quebec, Jean-Marc Fournier, who is respecting his provincial jurisdiction. Quebec and Manitoba don't want home cultivation. Mr. Speaker, it's sad to say, but the reality is that the government is being stubborn and not listening to anyone. They didn't listen to First Nations. They didn't listen to Quebec and Manitoba. Can the Prime Minister assure us of one thing, that there won't be any pot uh, production at 24 Sussex. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our government is strictly legalizing and regulating cannabis to prevent our young people from having access to it. And we want to ensure that those profits don't end up in the hands of organized crime. The current system is not working. It's allowing criminals to profit from the system, and it's still far too easy for our young people to buy Pot. That's why our government engaged in consultations with experts, police chiefs, and many other stakeholders. We will end up with a good bill to protect our youth. Order. The Honourable Member for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, right now, fishermen are assembling a blockade of lobster traps outside the office of the Member of Parliament for Mackenzie Bathurst. They are doing this because of the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans' extreme decision to close the lobster fishery in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Now, the Minister knows that a decision like this is going to have a serious financial impact on the families there, especially after his rule change that happened at the end of April. Why does it have to come to a blockade to get this Minister's attention? Mr. Speaker, I can't imagine my Conservative colleague would suggest that we not take the most robust measures necessary to protect the North Atlantic right whale, because she will understand, as all Canadians do, that protecting the North Atlantic right whale is vital to ensuring the continued access to international markets for over $6 billion of Canadian fish and seafood exports. Mr. Speaker, we understand that this decision is difficult. We understand that uh, fishers and plant workers will be, uh, will be concerned. That's why I have the privilege of meeting representatives tomorrow in New Brunswick, and we'll continue to work with them to ensure they're protected. Honourable Member for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For weeks, the Liberals have refused to tell Canadians how much their carbon tax is going to cost them. Yeah. And to use the Prime Minister's own words, this is very insulting to Canadians. They've been completely straightforward with the fact they tend to proceed with a carbon tax, but when it comes to telling us exactly how much it's going to cost, they're eerily silent. Yeah. Voters in Ontario have spoken. And what they said at the ballot box is they don't want to have a carbon tax. But, Mr. Speaker, they have a chance today. Will they at least tell us how much it's going to cost them? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We published a report on April 30th doing exactly that. It talks about pricing pollution. It talks about the 80 to 90 million tons, equivalent of taking 25 million cars off the road that pricing achieves. But we believe that provinces are best placed in deciding what to do with revenues. We've been clear, pro revenues will stay in the province. 80% of Canadians live in a province where they have a price on pollution. They've given back quite money in tax cuts, in rebates, they've invested in clean innovation. They should go ask those provinces what they're doing with their revenues. Honourable order, the Honourable Member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, what I'm asking this minister 
is for her to tell us what her department officials told her is the cost to Canadian families on their carbon tax. Yes. She yes. knows what the answer is. But breaking news, today we understand why Ontarians actually voted for Doug Ford in the election in Ontario. They said that voters feel that costs are out of control mm -hmm. and they view carbon taxes as nothing more than a cash grab. Well, Mr. Speaker, why won't these MPs at least tell voters in Canada how much of their cash do they intend on grabbing? Honourable Minister of Environment. I don't know how much clearer I can be. All revenues from pricing go back into the province. It is up to provinces to decide what to do. But let's talk about the economy. Let's talk about the 600,000 jobs right. that our government created with Canadians. Let's talk about the lowest unemployment rate in generations. Let's talk about how we can take serious action on climate change and we can grow our economy. The previous government could do neither. Here, here. No need for so much noise. Order members know they're required to uh, not interrupt in the House when someone else has the floor. The time to speak is when they have the floor. Each side gets its chance to take part in debate. And we wait until we have our turn. Honourable member for Rimouskin is Jotte Miskota de Basse. Mr. Speaker, David Dodge, the former governor of the Bank of Canada, said yesterday that people might die protesting the Trans Mountain Expansion Project and that we'll basically just have to deal with that. I'm really surprised I have to say this in this House, but the right to protest peacefully is protected by the Canadian Charter of Rights and is fundamental to our democracy. Will the government condemn David Dodge's comments or do they agree with him? But the pipeline must go through at any cost, including the lives of peaceful protesters. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Our government believes in the right of peaceful protest. Honourable Member for Rimouskin et Basque. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's not very reassuring. I would have liked a longer response than that. Now, I'd remind you that in December 2016, the Minister of Natural Resources in this House said that peaceful protesters against the pipeline might end up facing the Canadian Armed Forces. After such words from a cabinet member, it's concerning to see that a senior uh, civil servant uh, like David Dodge would be okay with protesters being killed. So I would like the government to recognize not only that uh, peaceful civil disobedience is an essential tool of democracy, but call out the words of David Dodge, the Honorable Minister of the Environment. We believe in Canadians' right to protest peacefully. Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, a study from Equiterre has shown that pipeline management in this country is a joke. In 2017, the number of incidents, leaks, and spills and other problems increased by 41%. And so-called automatic detection systems failed to, to detect half of these incidents. And when the companies get caught, what happens? Nothing. Notices of violation and other order orders are systematically ignored and no one ever loses their license. When will this government clean up its act and deal with these disrespectful oil companies? The Honorable Minister of Transport. It's the duty of any government to get oil to market and this fundamental task must be carried out in great respect of uh, environmental rules. The Environmental uh, Pipeline Safety Act reinforces Canada's system by enshrining the polluter pay system in federal legislation. Developers will be held responsible uh, regardless of fault in case of incidents. Well, member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. As Liberals put billions into Cater Morgan, betraying their promised sunny ways renewable future, pipeline spills and accidents are rising. Equitaire's new report on oil pipeline safety found less than 50% of incidents are reported. The National Energy Board is, quote, not capable of handling the work on its plate. It isn't protecting citizens or the environment. So why did the government buy a leaky old pipeline knowing these risks? And how will it police itself when the next leak happens? 
Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, as I've just said, uh, it is a duty of government to make sure that we get our resources to market, and that's precisely what we're doing. At the same time, anyone who is responsible for a pipeline must understand that our principle of polluter pay applies, and anyone who is responsible for it must take care of any incidents that do occur. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Mr. Speaker, when I reported to the House that the Fraser Institute had calculated that 81 per cent of middle-class taxpayers were paying more under this government, the Prime Minister said, no, that report didn't say any such thing, prompting the authors of the report to go to the newspapers and say, and I quote, yes, most middle-class families are paying more in income tax, Mr. Speaker. So we can't trust this government on taxes. No. We asked them to come clean and tell us how much will this carbon tax cost these same middle-class families? Our uh, Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to keep on saying the same thing. We published a report on April 30th. I am happy to personally give it uh, to the member opposite. What does it say? It says that pricing pollution works. It says that it reduces uh, emissions by 80 to 90 million tonnes and that we've been clear revenues go back into the provinces where they come from. 80% of Canadians live in Ontario, Quebec, Alberta or BC where there's a price on pollution. You can go ask the, those provinces what they do with the revenues, but for example, British Columbia gives the revenues back in tax cuts. Order. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford will come to order, please. The Honourable Member for Carleton. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we're not asking for their April public relations pamphlet. Yeah. We're asking for the costing that the departments have already done on this. We're, we're calling on the government to release all costing documents that any department has produced or shared internally since the last election day. That is the only way we will know the real cost of this carbon tax. Will this minister and this government release all of those documents unredacted so Canadians know what this tax will cost? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to talk to Canadians. Canadians, we have. Uh, you should go to provinces and ask what provinces are going to do with the revenue. Sorry. I will through the speaker because I think there's a lot of misinformation here. Misinformation from the other side. All revenues will stay in the province and the provinces can give back the revenues as tax cut. But what Canadians really want to know is what is the Conservative Party's climate plan? Um, members know about the rule that members should address the chair. It's designed to avoid members referring to one another as you and so forth, but I think it's best to keep to that rule in general. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, as these Liberals are looking forward to getting to some beautiful cottage on some lake, Canadians are suffering under the burden of higher gas prices. Yeah. Prices as high as $1.60 a litre in some provinces. Prices that will only rise further when this Liberal government imposes its carbon tax. We want to know the price, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, if this government is going to make Canadians pay the price, we're going to make the government pay the price by keeping them here for 25 hours straight voting on their yeah. carbon tax. Members seem to be very excited about that 24-hour prospect. But the Honourable Minister of Environment, order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we don't have to go through a stunt that the Conservatives are going to pull because we have already answered the question. 80% of Canadians live in a province where the province has decided what to do with the revenues. The revenues have gone back in tax cuts, they've gone into investment and clean innovation. We have been clear that provinces are best placed to decide what to do with the revenues. But once again, what Canadians want to know is what is the Conservatives' climate change plan? 
The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, Mr. Speaker, we know they claim they're going to collect all this tax and then give it to provincial politicians. That's not our question. We're asking how much the tax will cost. If it had nothing to do with the federal government, well, then it wouldn't be in the federal budget bill. Exactly. They've written a bill asking this House for permission to raise taxes on Canadians, but they won't even tell us what that tax will cost. There's no taxation without information. When will they give us the information on the cost of this part? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Once again, I refer to the April 30th document that provides the information, but let's talk about what we've done. We have created jobs with Canadians, historic numbers of jobs. We have the lowest unemployment rate in generations. We cut taxes on the middle class and raise them on the, 1%, the top 1%. We have given money back to Canadians through the Canada Child Benefit, so nine out of ten families are better off, and we've raised 300 kids out of poverty. That's real action. We're going to continue taking real action on climate change and growing our economy. I wish the other party would join us. Honourable Order. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. Mr. Speaker, if we take an intersectional gender lens to the cost of the carbon tax, it's arguable that low-income women, particularly senior women and single mothers, will bear the disproportionate cost of the carbon tax. That's true. The Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, has said that poverty is sexist, and he knows, he has the data on how much it's going to cost these lower-income women. When will he end this carbon tax cover-up? Yeah. Honourable Minister for the Status of Women. Speaker, we're thrilled to see the Conservatives take an interest in gender equality. This is what real change looks like. Yeah. I'd like to remind the Honourable Member that we gave more funds to families who need the support the most with the Canada Child Benefit. They voted against it. I'd like to remind her that we lowered taxes for the middle class and raised them on the 1%. They voted against it. We're introducing pay equity legislation. They've worked every step of the way to stop that process. We're supporting women and families with child benefit and child care opportunities. They voted against it. Honourable member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Real change looks like imposing a tax grab that does nothing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which they know while imposing a tax that's going to disproportionately harm low-income women. That's real change that no Canadian wants. Dear God. Mr. Speaker, this government is not providing Canadians representation as they're increasing their taxes. They have this data. Why are they hiding it from Canadians? Honourable Minister for the Status of Women. Mr. Speaker, through the Canada Child Benefit Plan, nine out of ten Canadian families are better off under our plan than they were are truly concerned about the well-being of those working hard to join the middle class, why do they take the opportunity at every step of the way to vote against plans and programs we introduce? Mr. Speaker, we have, we have a housing strategy, 10 years, $40 billion, yes. at least 25 per cent of which will support women and their families with low incomes. My honourable colleague can jump on board and support our plan to grow the middle class. Order. The Honourable Member for Berthier Mesquilanger. Mr. Speaker, after the Prime Minister said he would be flexible, now it's the Agriculture Minister saying that we can leave the door open to sacrificing um, supply management. The Liberals keep saying in the House that they'll defend supply management, that they're the party that set it up and so on. But they need to walk the talk. The question is simple. Will the government defend the supply management system in its entirety during NAFTA negotiations? Yes or no? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government firmly supports the supply management system and will defend it. The Prime Minister, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Cabinet members and the entire caucus, as well as trade negotiators for Canada, have been clear and unequivocal from the beginning of the NAFTA negotiations. Our government strongly supports the supply management system and will continue to defend it 
and all of the interests of Canadian farming families. For Cowichan, Malahat, Langford. Mr. Speaker, more than 13,000 family farms in Canada work under the supply management system. The Prime Minister said the government would be flexible with our system in NAFTA renegotiations, and now the Agriculture Minister wants to wait to see what's on the table. Mr. Speaker, what is that supposed to mean? When are these Liberals going to stop with the non-answers, protect our family farms, and stand up for the supply-managed sectors? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as we've said, we are the party that set up the supply management system, and we will defend it. It is a model that provides stability for the entire world. We are the party that fought for it and will continue to fight for it. We have said many times that the words from our American partners are unacceptable. Aye. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Mr. Speaker, the Agriculture Minister claims that Canadian farmers are fully supportive of the Liberal carbon wow. tax. I don't think they are actually consulting with Canadian farmers at all. In fact, the President of the Western Canadian Wheat Growers said, farmers don't agree on everything, but if there is one issue they stand together on, is it opposition to the carbon tax. Right. So how can the Agriculture Minister be misrepresenting farmers? Will he end the carbon tax cover-up? Will he tell us how much the Liberals' farm-killing carbon tax will cost our rural families? Let's just start by noting that we're all in this together. The climate change is real, and no one knows this more than farmers. When I talk to farmers, they're worried about droughts. They're worried about floods. They're worried about extreme weather. But once again, it is up to provinces to determine what they're going to do. Provinces can decide that they're going to exempt fuels used by farmers. It is up to them to design a system that makes, that makes sense in their province. It's up to them to decide what they're going to do with the revenues. The Honourable Member for Prince Albert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Ag Minister's claim that farmers support a carbon tax are ridiculous. APAS, Grain Growers of Canada, are speaking out against it. The province of Saskatchewan has even taken the Liberals to court over the tax. Saskatchewan's farmers are well aware that the cost of a carbon tax will have an impact on their livelihood. The Liberals refuse to tell us how much it will cost. Mr. Speaker, when will the Liberals come clean on this carbon tax? The Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, as I've said, farmers and ranchers understand that we need to protect our environment, that we need to take action on climate change. As we've said, it is up to provinces like Saskatchewan to determine how they're going to implement pricing, and they can give the revenues right back. They can give revenues back to farmers. They can decide to cut the provincial sales tax. That is their own decision. That is the right way. But we believe that we're all in this together, and I really wish the opposition wouldn't make this a partisan issue because we have kids, we have grandkids, and they owe a clean future, and they also are. Order! 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 This is a good way to lose a question. Order! The Honourable Member for Richmond Centre. Mr. Speaker, one of the largest challenges seniors are facing is being able to afford the basic necessities of life. We all know that when the Liberals impose new tax grabs, it hikes the cost of living and seniors are dispro pro pro disproportionately affected. Yeah. Why won't the Liberals finally review what their carbon tax will cost seniors? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted to talk about the well-being and the welfare of our seniors. Unfortunately, I am less happy to talk about the fact that Conservatives voted every, against every measure we put in favour of seniors. We have brought back to 65 years old the age of eligibility to old age security, which is going to prevent 100,000 seniors from entering into severe poverty. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the Harper Conservatives voted against that. We raised the Guaranteed Income Supplement to help 900,000 seniors. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, again, our Conservative friends voted against that. Wow. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samilkameen Nicholas. Liberals attack small business 
time and time again. And yes, they're they forcing do. job creators to pay a carbon tax that will increase input costs, and the Prime Minister refuses to tell them how much it will cost. Now, small businesses know that this misguided tax will impact the way they do business, how many employees they can hire, and some will be forced to shut down. Why won't the Prime Minister tell small businesses, the lifeblood of our economy, how much more they will be paying with his national carbon tax? The Honourable Minister of Small Business and Tourism. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about this government's support of small businesses. This is the government that lowered small business tax rate to 9% by 2019. What did the Conservatives do? The Conservatives yes. voted against it. Mr. Speaker, we just brought forward the first ever women's entrepreneurship strategy. Almost $2 billion in support for women entrepreneurs. What did the Conservatives do? I bet they voted against it. Mr. Speaker, this government will continue supporting small businesses. They are the backbone of the economy. We will not just say it, we will support it. And what will the Conservatives continue to do? Vote against them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. We don't need any chanting. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Mr. Speaker, after the Trump administration imposed a devastating 25% tariffs on steel and 10% on aluminum, workers are worried about how they're going to take care of their families. Just the steel industry alone has at least 22,000 direct jobs and supports another 100,000 indirect jobs, especially in Ontario and in my community of Hamilton. Yesterday, the Prime Minister avoided this very simple question, which I will ask again. When will the government announce a support package for steel and aluminum workers like it did for the software lumber workers last year? The Honourable Minister for Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, we will always defend our steel and aluminum workers. We've done so in the past and will continue to do so going forward. As the member opposite knows full well, the tariffs that have been imposed by the Americans is completely unacceptable. It's unwarranted. That is why we're working with industry. We're working with workers to determine the best path forward. But again, make no mistake about it. We will always defend our workers in the aluminum and steel sectors. member for Jean Pierre. It's all one thing to talk about here in the House, but there are thousands of workers and businesses all across the country who are facing uncertainty due to the unacceptable tariffs on aluminum and steel. Given the risks and in preparation for the next few months, which could be grim, the government needs to act quickly. These workers and companies deserve swift and concrete support, not just empty words. Like Quebec did, is the government soon going to announce a support package to protect our jobs and companies and be transparent about it, especially for the workers? The Honourable Minister of Economic Development. Mr. Speaker. The tariffs uh, slapped on our exports by the U.S. are unacceptable. That is why we will continue to defend our workers and companies in steel and aluminum. I met with the Producers Association, and all options are on the table, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. North. Monsieur le Président, je suis... Mr. Speaker, I'm sure everyone here in the House would agree there's never been a better time to diversify our markets. Last year, new trade deals entered into force with the European Union and Ukraine, reducing tariffs and opening up combined new markets totaling over half a billion consumers for Canadian exporters. We'll do exactly the same. Can the minister please update this House on Canada's efforts to bring this important agreement into force? Yes. Of international trade. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Scarborough North for his excellent question and his excellent work. Mr. Speaker, Canadians understand there's never been a better time to diversify. That's why with the CPTPP, Mr. Speaker, we will improve market access. We will improve new industries for Canadians. That means that workers, small and medium-sized businesses, their families and their communities will have a better chance to succeed, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work for Canadians, and Canadians know one thing. They know they can trust us when it comes to international trade, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Order. Speaker, the Toronto Liberals have been charging a hidden carbon tax since 2009. It has doubled the price of electricity in Ontario. It has cost tens of thousands of jobs as companies move to the United States. It has forced seniors on fixed incomes to choose whether or not to eat 
or heat. Right. And now the right. Ottawa Liberals want to charge another carbon tax. When will they stop the cover-up and tell Canadians how much that carbon tax is going to cost? Right. The Honourable Minister of Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I Indeed, I didn't have enough time in my earlier response to detail other measures that we put in favour of seniors, and unfortunately, Conservative, Harper Conservatives voted against that. We enhanced the Canada Pension Plan six months after we came into office to increase the generosity, the flexibility, the care with which our seniors will be able to retire in, in the, when they do retire. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, our Conservative friends voted against. Mr. Speaker, we also launched the first ever historic national housing strategy, which will have a direct impact on seniors. Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, in Ontario, the auto industry competes with the U.S. for investment. In Michigan, there's no carbon tax. But in Ontario, the Liberals are imposing a carbon tax scheme that is putting our auto sector at a disadvantage. Now the auto sector also faces the risks of tariffs. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals reveal the cost of the carbon tax on the auto industry? And will they agree to exempt the auto industry from their carbon tax so we can keep these jobs in Canada? The Honourable Minister of Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, we have a th thriving and vibrant automotive sector in Ontario and across the country. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because they have a government that backs them up and supports them all the way. Since 2015, we've been working very closely with the automotive sector, building partnerships. And what that has resulted is in a $5.6 billion total investment in the automotive sector. This has helped create and preserve thousands of jobs, Mr. Speaker. This is what we're focused on. We're focused on growth and jobs, and we'll continue to support the automotive sector and build the car of the future as well. well member for Abbotsford. Enough of the carbon tax cover-up. Canadians are fed up with the Prime Minister's refusal to tell them how much this harmful carbon tax will cost them. In BC, drivers are now paying a whopping dollar and sixty cents to tank up their cars. The Liberal carbon tax is going to add 11 cents to that. The price of everything, from groceries to home heating, is going to go up under this Liberal government. When will the Prime Minister finally tell us how much will this carbon tax cost the average Canadian family? And what's he hiding? The Honourable Minister of Environment. So where uh, are the Conservatives hiding their climate plan? That's all we all want to know. Where's the climate plan? When it comes to putting a price on pollution, we have an April 30th document. I am very happy to share that personally with the member opposite. We often have conversations, happy to deliver it. I will hand it over to him because that's where it explains that pricing pollution is like taking 25 million cars off the roads and it's up to provinces what they do with the revenues. They can do tax cuts, they can uh, give it back through rebates, they can... I'd ask you know, Tim Manning and others not to interrupt when someone else has the floor. Order. You know, we'll member for Abbotsford. Again, no answer. You know, Mr. Speaker, the news gets worse. This Liberal government has admitted that it will not meet its climate change targets. We all know the Prime Minister is secretly planning to increase the carbon tax from $50 to $100 to $200, even to $300 per tonne in the coming years. So what's he hiding? Mr. Speaker, can you imagine how astronomically expensive life would become in such a world? So one more time to the Prime Minister. How much will this carbon tax cost? The, the Honourable Minister of Environment. It's really sad that we have fake news coming from the other side. Misinformation and fake news. The only thing that's being hidden is what is the Conservatives' climate plan. Maybe the next time they get up, they can tell us what their climate plan is, how they're going to tackle uh, climate change, and how they're going to create jobs, which they weren't, either, they weren't able to do either. Order. order. Now, the member for Dufferin Caledon will come to order along with others. I had to get the drumming.
The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, the new Trans-Pacific Partnership will have devastating effects on Canadian workers. At a time when we need economic leadership, the Liberals come up with a trade deal that's going to cost us 58,000 jobs. The Liberals ink a deal with no mention of climate change. That's hardly progressive. Why is this government promoting a trade deal that will be devastating to the economy and the environment? The Honourable Minister of International Trade. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. We will always be there to support stakeholders, but Canadians know that there's never been a better time to diversify our markets, and that's precisely why, Mr. Speaker, we signed the CPTPP and introduced legislation this morning to ratify it. That deal will open new markets and new opportunities for our small and medium-sized businesses all across the country. That will translate into benefits for families and workers in the communities of all members here in the House. Canadians know they can count on us when it comes to international trade. Now Canadians know that you're choosing the economy over the environment. Mm -hmm. The legislation for Trans-Pacific Partnership was tabled today despite overwhelming evidence that this deal will be devastating to auto workers and supply management. NAFTA is in shambles and Trump has launched an attack on our auto sector with threats of outrageous and illegal tariffs. And what are the Liberals doing to help auto workers? Well, today they're tabling a deal that's a betrayal to auto workers, their families and the communities that depend on them. Why does this government insist on ratifying this terrible trade deal that will cost our economy close to 58,000 jobs? Yeah. Honourable Minister of International Trade. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for a question. It seems that it's only the NDP, Mr. Speaker, that does not understand that it's, there's never been a better time to diversify, Mr. Speaker. Canadians understand across our nation, but only the NDP does not understand that there's no better time to diversify. That's why we signed the, the CPTPP. That's why we introduced a lot this morning, Mr. Speaker, because we want to create new markets, new opportunities for workers across our nation, Mr. Speaker. Canadians who are watching us know they can trust us when it comes to international trade. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, order. Hello. Order. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, I've asked at least 60 questions about the border crisis, wanting to know if there was any plan for dealing with it, but I'm still waiting for an answer. I have a report from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security which confirms their concern about illegal border crossings both ways. Quebecers and Canadians feel betrayed by the Liberals who aren't taking their safety concerns seriously and apparently don't want to negotiate with the Americans. It's the government's responsibility to enforce border integrity. Where's the plan? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, our government remains determined to protect Canadians' safety and police the border. Canadians can be confident of that. The Conservatives want the border militarized in violation of international law. Those are not serious solutions. We continue to ensure that Canadian legislation is enforced and that our international obligations are met. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, as you can see, whatever they say, they clearly have no plan. The minister the other day said he was glad the opposition leader had been to La Call to the border crossing, but even their own immigration minister has never been when it's his portfolio. Canadians have taken note and have serious doubts about this government's ability to handle the problem. We'd like to have some answers. Is there a plan? Mr. Speaker, in the uh, report from, from uh, the, the U.S. Uh, this past week, uh, the comments, by and large, were very favourable about the relationship with Canada, about what they call the northern border, about the uh, strength of security and other operations uh, along that border. Uh, indeed, the former Secretary of Homeland Security, who is now Chief of Staff in the White House, uh, had nothing but praise for the Canadian border and said that uh, he was happy to work with Canada to ensure that that border was constantly thinning to the advantage of both countries. 
Now, no member for Bellechasse, Les Germains, Lévis. Mr. Speaker, let's make things clear. The Liberals have been cutting funding at the border since 2015, 302 million in cuts for criminal investigations. And with the Prime Minister's gaffe on Twitter, the border has become a sieve, and our border services officials have become tourism guides. My question is for the Minister of Immigration, not Public Safety. What is the plan to stop this illegal movement across the border? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman uh, speaks of uh, budget reductions with respect to uh, CBSA. If he, if he, in fact, follows the governmental decisions with respect to those fiscal measures, he will find that they were implemented in 2014. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, he was the minister at the time. member for Scarborough Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, with the growth in the digital economy in Canada, access to reliable telecommunication services at an affordable price is essential for Canadians. However, Canadians currently pay some of the highest prices for wireless and internet services in comparison to other developed countries, making them inaccessible for some. This is something that I hear repeatedly from many of my constituents. Can the minister please share with us what the government plans to do to ensure Canadians have access to reliable, affordable and quality wireless and internet services? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Innovation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Scarborough Aging Court for her advocacy on this issue. She's been a true champion. And we believe Canadians deserve quality, low-priced telecommunication services. And that's why we've asked industry to step up in a big way. And through the Connecting Families program, low-cost internet will be provided to hundreds of thousands of Canadian families right across Canada. Mr. Speaker, our government will always fight for lower prices and better prices for consumers. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' moral equivalence with Israel and its enemies is notorious. And when they had an opportunity to stand against a one-sided motion against Israel at the United Nations yesterday, and in direct contradiction to votes in this House this week, they did it again. The Liberals directed Canada's diplomats to sit on their hands to abstain from standing with the only democracy in the Middle East. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals always show up for the annual Walk with Israel, as fair-weather friends would. Why did the Liberals refuse to stand with Israel yesterday? The Conservatives continue to make Canada's long-standing steadfast support for Israel a partisan issue, despite being told not to do so. Canada has long been a friend of Israel, and we believe the resolutions at the UN should accurately reflect the situation on the ground. That's why Canada supported a U.S. amendment to yesterday's resolution that would have explicitly referred to the role by Hamas uh, in the situation in Gaza. Hamas is a terrorist organization, and Canada calls on the international community to stand up to Hamas. Hamas must in end its incitement to violence against Israel. I'll ask the member, I'll remember for Battle River Coldfoot to come to order. I'll remember for uh, Vancouver Kingsway. As we stand on the cusp of cannabis legalization, we face the deep irony that Canadians continue to be arrested at alarming rates for behaviour that will soon be legal. It was inexcusable for the Liberal government to exclude pardons from the Cannabis Act, and now the Senate, the so called Chamber of Sober Second Thought has also neglected to address this glaring omission. It's enough to question their sobriety, Mr. Speaker. When will the hundreds of thousands of Canadians who carry unjust records well, for simple possession finally receive amnesty? I would urge the member for Vancouver Kingsway to be cautious with his language. Uh, the Honourable Minister of Public Safety. About the other place, yes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Parliament is in the process of dealing with uh, two very important pieces of legislation, C-45 and C-46. Uh, they are, uh, together, 
uh, making some of the most profound changes with respect to uh, the, uh, the the handling, the legal handling of uh, of cannabis ever in the history of of Canada. Uh, when that process is completed, uh, the law will change. Uh, and at that time, Mr. Speaker, the uh, government will consider all appropriate measures to ensure fairness in our system. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Mr. Speaker, today the government announced its vision of the new homelessness partnering strategy. This announcement is the culmination of over a year's work, including the release of the first ever national housing strategy, with its commitment of $2 billion to combat homelessness as well as Canada-wide consultations with experts and community stakeholders. Could the Minister Responsible for Housing explain to the House how the new homeless partner homelessness partnering strategy will help fight homelessness in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to begin by thanking the member for Shefford for his support for the fight against homelessness. I'd also like to thank the members of the advisory committee for their hard work and the excellent report they produced. Yesterday in Montreal, I had the opportunity to launch a program that will double investments in homelessness and reduce homelessness by 50 percent in Canada in the years to come. Through our partnerships and our investments, we are restoring federal leadership in housing to make sure everyone has a safe and affordable roof over their head. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, let's be eminently clear to the Parliamentary Secretary, when they refuse to stand with our allies, we will challenge them to do better. Right. That is our job. That is what we were sent here to do, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. One wonders why they're so bent on getting on the UN Security Council just to abstain once they get there. Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Secretary voted, the Prime Minister voted, to immediately designate the Iranian, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a listed terrorist entity under the Criminal Code. That's how they voted. So when will the Liberals follow the will of the House and immediately designate the IRGC a terrorist organization. Yeah, yeah. Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in fact, the IRGC's uh, CUD force is already listed as a terrorist entity, and that is the uh, branch of the, of the force that, in, in fact, uh, involves itself in terrorist operations. In addition, Mr. Speaker, Iran is a state sponsor of terror, all listed under the State Immunity Act. Uh, and, Mr. Speaker, the uh, the senior officials of that regime are already subject to special economic measures under the uh, under the SEMO legislation. Uh, the process for listing actually involves an investigation by the RCMP and CSIS, and that process will go forward. Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to homegrown marijuana, yesterday the Prime Minister answered to explain his power trip that he was ignoring the provinces, the opposition, the Senate, the cities, and the police, all the better to fight organized crime. Uh-huh. That's his plan to fight organized crime? Allow people to grow three or four marijuana plants in their garden? Why can't the government leave those decisions to those who actually manage the problems in the field? The Honourable Health Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, protecting the Canadian, the health and safety of Canadians is our top priority. We're making sure we have a system that will be safe, and we have created legal resources for those who uh, cannot uh, grow marijuana for themselves at home. We're taking an approach that a number of American jurisdictions have taken to regulating cannabis. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. I think we're not, she doesn't have the right notes, Mr. Speaker. Legalizing cannabis is one thing, but making marijuana plants as garden variety as tomato plants, that's quite another. Quebec has chosen not to allow homegrown pot because they think it won't help keep marijuana out of the reach of kids. That's Quebec's legitimate choice. And it's consistent with this government's stated goal of limiting minors' access to marijuana. So why the disrespect for Quebec's choices that are within its jurisdiction? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, protecting the health and safety of Canadians is this government's top priority. Home growing will displace the illegal market in Canada. We also will provide a legal source for those who don't have 
access to marijuana otherwise, for example, uh, in online uh, and so on. We're consulting experts in other jurisdictions that have also legalized cannabis, and we are still uh, studying the best way of going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier today, a major report on the safety failures of the pipeline safety system in this country was released by Equiterre. It's a very disturbing record, and it's getting worse. 55% des incidents au 55 of Incidents occurred in Quebec since 2008, and 50% of those spills occurred in 2017. Independent investigation into this unacceptable record of shoddy monitoring and weak enforcement. The Honourable Minister of Environment. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Getting resources to market must be done with the highest regard for safety and the protection of the environment. The Pipeline Safety Act strengthens Canada's pipeline safety system, enshrining the polluter pays principle into federal law. Companies are liable regardless of fault. Our budget 2017 includes $17.4 million for the NEB to enhance its pipeline safety oversight activities, along with a further $1.9 million to provide Canadians with timely access to information on energy regulations and pipeline safety.